This podcast is brought to you by the Albany Public Library main branch and the generosity of listeners like you. What is a podcast? God, Daddy, these people talk as much as you do. Razib Khan's Unsupervised Learning. Thanks for listening to the ungated version of the Unsupervised Learning Podcast. If you want to read some essays on some of these topics, please check out razib.substack.com. Again, that's razib.substack.com. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Unsupervised Learning Podcast, and I guess uh, YouTube at some point. Um, so today I'm here with Li Fong. Uh, he's someone I've kind of um, started following uh, over the last three or four years, uh, he is an investigative journalist, so it's kind of a, a little different uh, conversation than I usually have. Um, he's, uh, you know, a reporter. He does, you know, all that shoe leather stuff that we hear about. And so I want to ask him about that. But um, just so you guys know, he has his own Substack. stack. Um, I will post the link to it. You can find him there. Uh, he worked at The Intercept for many, many years, actually, before that. And he did some other stuff with, um, you know, I think like, CAP, Center for American Progress, and other places like that. So we can get into that older stuff later, but um, mostly I want to talk about what he's doing right now. Um, Lee, do you have anything else to say for yourself? No, that's basically it. Thanks for the intro. It's the, the website. I bought a domain, my my name in the domain, leefong.com. So you can just go to that for my Substack. All right. Um, so uh, I guess uh, the first question that I have uh, is that, you know, we're having issues in um, the media ecosystem in terms of cuts, layoffs, revenue problems, um, you know. So I guess the way I would describe it to the listener, my perception is, uh, you know, there's the internet shows up about like 25, 30 years ago, depending on how you want to define it. They didn't really know how to do um, anything with it initially. Everything was free. But, you know, most people were still reading print. And then in the 2000s and the teens, there was a pivot to online. Only a few outlets have really, really um, mastered this. The like New York Times, for example, has it. Wall Street Journal, a few other places, right? And then you have the collapse of digital media recently. Not the collapse, but you know what's happening to Vice, where they're filing for bankruptcy. Uh, Vox really didn't end up doing its thing. All of its founders left. Uh, you know, Ezra Klein is now a columnist at the New York Times. Matt Iglesias has his own Substack. Um, and I think the, um, other co-founder last name is Bell. I think she's doing some other startups. So, you know, we're in this moment, uh, in the early 2020s. And one of the things that people often say is there are whole areas of journalism that are collapsing because they don't drive clicks. Like people want culture war, you know, I don't want to say clickbait cause that's a very like teens thing to say, but you know, like the kind of stuff that's commentary, actually a lot of the stuff that people say, Substack uh, is good for. So, you know, you can have your own thoughts as an individual. Uh, that's what I do. You know, I offer my interpretation of a lot of times scientific literature um, as an individual. There are other people who are commenters. And then you have like one man, um, you know, one person shows like Glenn Greenwald. I, I don't think he's on Substack anymore, but that's where he was for a while. Uh, but you do something different. And uh, what you're doing is actually one of the things that um, people have said. Uh, media commentators, media observers, investigative journalism, where you need institutional resources, you need the support uh, of a bigger organization. And so, like, what's going on with you? Like, I mean, how are you doing it? Uh, was that a BS, like, line of reasoning? I mean, <laughs> I'm I'm actually kind of perplexed. Because, like, if you go to your sub stack, like, uh, you're getting shit done. I mean, you're digging stuff up on people. It's kind of scary, but whatever. I mean, <laughs> I mean like, I mean, so I mean, like, t tell me what's going on here. Do you have a take on it? Like, do you have a perception? Because I don't know any of this stuff. I just know what I read. Uh, are they lying to me? No, I mean, it's it's kind of true. I, I feel like if I had institutional support, I could do longer, more deep divey features. Like, if I left the Substack, I mean, I just launched this thing about. A month and a week and a half ago like it's pretty new so i'm still experimenting with what works but if i had more resources and time yeah I, I could like kind of you know go deep on a subject publish a long feature piece but i'm 
doing these kind of thousand word, 1500 word investigations and trying to do one or two a week because, you know, people are paying a couple dollars a month uh, for me and they could be spending that on their HBO now go whatever it's called now. And so many other subscriptions, I want to provide as much content to make their money worth it. And, you know, I've just gotten used to this. I've, I used to live in the DC area and you get a lot of scoops by just going to interesting events. For the last 12 years, I've lived in San Francisco, still covering mostly national politics, but really kind of everything under the sun. And I've gotten used to just um, finding different information streams that I can transform into reporting. So I'm looking at, you know, you know corporate disclosures, uh, legal filings, uh, political you know, content streams. I'm, I'm checking all the different media outlets. I'm looking at social media. I'm talking to sources, I'm calling them and pestering them all day. And hopefully with that kind of wide net, I, I find scoops because what I'm trying to do, I might do a little bit of commentary, to be honest. You know, I um, I would like to kind of express myself and Substack gives me a, a platform to do non-traditional things. And I want to kind of experiment with it and do some fun stuff. But I think the majority of the content will be in the style of traditional investigative reporting, you know, looking at deep in a subject, you know, exposing hidden documents or, you know, other new nuggets of information, giving them context and, and you know, putting it into the kind of public interest frame of why it matters. That's what I'm going to be doing. And, I, and hopefully applying it to subjects that other people are simply not covering or not covering well, in my opinion. So I, I, I'm able to do it because I've, I've gotten used to it. I've lived in San Francisco uh, far away from the action. So I've, I've had to develop these kind of streams of content for a very long time. Yeah, so I mean, it sounds like what you're saying, Lee, is you have a particular skill set, um, and so it was easy to translate into this kind of um, independent Substack format. Uh, whereas other people, I don't know, I mean, work for sixty minutes or something. Obviously, you're expecting a certain level of support. So, a, a question that I actually have for you is, um, uh, you're an individual now. Um, and you're not associated with the intercept or whatever. Uh, does that open or close doors for you? Is it a net zero? I'm just kind of I'm wondering what you think. So, for example, if you emailed me and said you were Lee Fung from the New York Times, I would put it on block. Not gonna lie, um, I don't want to deal with. Um, I mean, I'd still be a little worried if you emailed me because, uh, like, I know the stuff you do. <laughs> it's coming. Don't worry. Just I'm getting ready. Don't. <laughs> I can't come half cocked, you know. So, <laughs> you know, but I, so I mean, what, what, what do you think? It's, it's a negative or a positive or a net zero? I mean, in terms of not having the institutional, because you're just, you're Lee now, you're Lee Fung, you know, and you're not. I don't know. It, it's, it's a mix because even at the Intercept, you know, I think a lot of people write it off as a lefty rag, perhaps for good reason sometimes. But uh, it just, it depends. Like if I was at the Wall Street Journal or New York Times, and I was reaching out to a member of Congress or a major Fortune 500 corporation, yeah, I would totally have more access and getting a response. But, you know, a lot of the reporters at mainstream outlets, and I, I'm not talking about any particular person, there's just kind of like a style here where you're kind of a beat reporter. And if you're a beat reporter at one of the major outlets, you depend on access. And so you can never or I can, I don't want to say never, I don't want to speak in deterministic language, but it's very difficult to burn your sources or your, the kind of the trough from which you feed for content. You know, like if you're the, the white house reporter at the New York times, you got to maintain those relationships. If you're the Silicon Valley reporter for, you know, name a big outlet, you got to maintain those relationships. I have, you know, I have total freedom and, you know, if people want to respond to me, they can. If they want to give me access, they can. I, I think I'm a reasonable person. I'm a, I, I have high journalistic standards. It's, it's always better to kind of talk to me and, and make sure that I'm getting my facts straight and the context of my story correct. Um, but if people want to write me off, um, you know, that that's fine. I'm still going to do my journalism and hopefully it's still going to have an impact. That's cool. Okay, so um, that's, I mean, that's pretty much what I was assuming. Um, so I want to talk about a couple of the things you've written about. I mean, maybe more than a couple, but 
Um, I just uh, so I'm just for the for the listener uh, if they want to Google it while they're listening. I mean, people have been known to do that. Uh, one is diversity activists helped First Republic Bank push for weaker regulations. And then um, the second one, top Asian diversity consultant accused of defrauding low income housing fund. Now, I shouldn't laugh about this, but um, the second one, which you posted relatively recently, um, it's I almost was impressed by the chutzpah. That makes sense. Um, yeah. Oh, there's, there's chutzpah mean, there. Yeah. I mean, so this is like this is like top flight scam. Um, it is not. Uh, it was obviously premeditated. It was done in a very effective and efficient way. Um, they got like what, like fourteen million or something? You said um, the program netted twelve million. Although 12 it's not million. clear if every dollar of those that's fraudulent. It looks like the vast majority are. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So okay, the first piece um, you're talking about banking deregulation. And uh, so to just set the stage here, because this is I don't know if American, non American listeners will understand this. They probably have their own sorts of things. This is a um, multi generational um, uh, thing going on where certain types of, you know, we would call them identitarian now, activist organizations co sign for corporations. Um, and so it's kind of like bundling uh, brands. And so, you know, it would be uh, so, for example, I think Rainbow Push, Jesse Jackson's organization would kind of do things like this where they would kind of co-brand with corporations and the corporation would give them, um, you know, grants, you know, and they would say, oh, well, this corporation's a good corporate citizen and stuff like that. And sometimes it's really well, okay, I think it's obvious, but, um, you know, they'll be like, oh, well, actually, um, you know, sometimes you have a person who's a libertarian and they're like, you know what? Um, check cashing is great. It's great for minorities, uh, mostly, uh, you know, black and brown people or whatever uh, use it. So they're libertarian. They don't really they care about these issues, but it's a it's an argument you can use, you know, and then they'll get like some sort of um, not NGO, some nonprofit. And it's, you know, uh people of color voices for financial freedom. Like, okay, I'm, I'm just making this up, but this is the sort of thing that you will see, right? It'll be like something like that. Like who's against financial freedom for people of color, you know? Right. But if you're like a left-wing person or not even a left-wing person, you'd be like, okay, you know, that there's some serious issues with the high interest rates and, you know, and then the, the you know, the, 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 the trade group or the corporation can say, well, okay, you know what? Like our customers are mostly poor people of color, are you saying that poor people of color sh shouldn't have access to credit? And then there's this whole thing. And um, basically, you know, what I'm trying to like, explain to, the, to you guys out there is, you know, it's really hard for left wing activists in particular uh, to defend against this sort of move because then like they're in a different conversation that they don't want to have. Right. I mean, and look, so, yeah, I, I, this I, I mean, the way I would kind of look at this is that you know, we live in a kind of complex and confusing political environment. There are a lot of special interests that want to gain favor and avoid a regulation or gain a subsidy or, you know, whatever. They want to game the political system and there's a million ways to do it. Now, to convince the American people and policymakers and regulators that a special interest is not actually acting in a selfish interest, they tend to use third party validators that have some type of connection to a constituency group or to the public or what have you. And I think, you know, a lot of people on the left or liberals recognize that they look in the last 30 or 40 years that there, there were, you know, banks and, you know, telecom companies and tobacco companies that partnered with these, you know, smokers rights groups or, you know, um, Christian coalition focus on the family Americans for prosperity type groups as a, you know, as kind of an astroturf, a fake grassroots effort to win public policy. Because, you know, these, these groups act as a mental or moral shortcut for people to understand an issue. They go, oh, okay, I, it's, a, it's a Christian group. It's a veterans group. I, I support it. The same, the exact same thing goes on with the left, with liberals, with special interests. They just use what's a more efficient moral shortcut, you know, mental shortcut is to use these appeals to diversity, appeals to identitarianism, 
And so you have these civil rights groups, you know, almost all the, the mainline civil rights groups flush with corporate cash. And they're either they're paid either not to take an issue side on an issue or to actively lobby on behalf of the corporation. But you, they they are shielding the identity of the, of the company. And, you know, the first republic thing is, is interesting because, you know, the, the arguments are a little bit absurd. You know, this this Asian-American activist goes to the FDIC and says, First Republic makes so many important investments in minority communities, they should be exempt to stress tests and risk assessments and all these kind of financial uh, regulations that are, are were designed to prevent a, a meltdown like what happened earlier this year in the First Republic. And it's, a, it's it, you know, I, we don't have, it, it seems pretty clear what happened immediately after she did this, you know, she gets appointed to the First Republic board. She, her organization is now sponsored by the First Republic. And so that's the kind of traditional grift or kind of corruption or lobbying, whatever you want to call it, that we see across the board. What's funny about the story, and I think why you laugh, is that it's both the kind of uptown and the and the kind of maybe more seedy kind of corruption. She, she did this type of thing that, you know, Al, Sharp, Al Sharpton's organization and you know, even, you know, a lot of LGBT organizations have engaged in uh, on a high level on policy, but then did the low level grift of literally faking, allegedly faking all these applications to a low income housing program that, you know, she argued for, again, using this kind of moralistic identity language, and then just scam taxpayers by se- by submitting fake reimbursements, you know, submitting the names of Filipino American voters stealing the names of U.S. Marines at a, at a financial literary event, liter, literacy event and just to get reimbursement so she, she could kind of pad her own pockets of, and if her whole family got in on this, her, her brother, uh, her daughter, you know, they, they were all submitting these these fake names and getting gigantic cash reimbursements. Uh, so it's, it's just, it is kind of interesting. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's interesting that it's both the kind of the the high level scam that we see all across the country of um, making kind of covert lobbying arguments cloaked in the language of identitarianism, but then the kind of just more low-level stuff of, hey, we're going to defraud a government agency for low-income uh, housing. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, the word you uh, I think I, I would use is brazen. Um, you know, did she? Re- I mean, I mean, maybe I'm not a con con person, con man, so I I'm just like. You really thought you weren't going to get caught? I mean, so do you think that there's more things like this that we don't know about? I mean, I don't know. I mean, it just seems so obvious that they were going to get caught. I mean, it's not. I mean, we have, we don't. This is a civil complaint. The her own board is suing her for this engaging this thing. They have apparently went on a multi month long investigation, hired investigators, auditors. They seem to have a lot of proof. The family, uh, no one can find them. They they, they seem to have fled to the philippines uh i checked the docket the other day the la superior court it's not clear the files have been served on her so maybe she's gone missing too i'm not sure she hasn't responded to any of my requests for comment um but you know i don't i don't know at least the high level influence peddling stuff i mean so many people do this It's, it's such a cynical strategy it's not even that different from a lot of these consultants that you see in silicon valley that are doing these esg reports um that are going to big corporations and basically woke washing them saying, oh, you need to improve your ESG score. Just hire us. We're going to produce this glossy, you know, pamphlet for your company. And, you know, it'll be, uh, it'll increase, increase your, your index level in the BlackRock, whatever, uh, social responsibility fund. You know, it's, it's the same type of thing, but this level, this level of, of defrauding a low income housing program. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think this, this, this whole area is not well, not well kind of, there there aren't a lot of cops on the beat here. It's it's quite possible there's a lot more of this going on. Yeah, um yeah, I mean, I don't know too much about government contracting. I have friends that have done it and uh it's um let's just say that there's a little I mean all I'll say is there's a little less supervision than I was expecting. I'll put it that way. Um so <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't want to get into that. I don't want to get people in trouble. And I don't have con men friends, just just to be clear out there. But um, I'm not as shocked that this could happen after some of the things I have heard in terms of, like, 
you know, why aren't you, you know, I mean, whatever. Like, well, I mean, just, I mean, I mean if, if, uh, what, just read the cigar reports from Afghanistan, the special inspector general for yeah. Afghanistan reconstruction. It is mind blowing. Read any of those reports any year, once they started getting produced in like 20, 2007 or something, all of them are mind blowing. It's like these bathrooms cost multi million dollars that you know have no plumbing. These schools that no Afghans use cost like fifty million dollars. I mean, it's just mind blowing waste and fraud that you know a little bit got prosecuted, but very not not much given the 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 level of scam and why it, it hasn't been a bigger scandal and why politicians haven't jumped on this to call for more prosecutions of government contracting scam. I, I don't really understand. But then this is an endemic across the government, both state government and federal government. We have a lot of privatization and a lot of scamming going on, um, to use that term kind of broadly. And it's, you know, it's, it's why people don't have a lot of faith in the government, perhaps, you know. So um, I, I want to uh, cut to another story that, that I find interesting. And it's the kind of thing that um, I don't know the ideological valence. Like, honestly, uh, you know, I like to joke. I'm not a very political person. I obviously do follow the news, but I don't really think too closely about like what. So I, I just for the listeners out there, um, I'll probably lose some subscribers over this. But, you know, I think, like you know, if you want to get vaccinated, it's OK. I'm vaccinated. <laughs> um you know whatever oh, hot take. <laughs> you know no i mean i know i'm gonna lose some subscribers yeah but i don't care but um sometimes i'll tweet out um uh, you know if, if you're at risk get vaccinated and then like people are like you know they'll be like you fucking shit lib and i'm just like okay <laughs> I, was like, I, don't, I don't know i mean you know so it, 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 it's kind of weird because like there are all these coalitions these, these beliefs you have to have that are bundled together now. And yeah. you know, I grew up in, I grew up in Oregon and the people that were against vaccinations when I was a kid are not the people that are against vaccinations now. And the whole thing is like super weird to me. And then also there's the whole, uh, you know, so I, you know, there's the whole idea of vaccines can like, you know, do no wrong, which is also dumb. Like I have a, you know, one of my, uh, we were best friends in eighth grade, you know, middle school, Anyway, um, so I know a guy, he was inducted, I mean, and listeners know this story, he was inducted into the Marines, uh, or like, you know, he went through like basic training or whatever, and he had to go get some last vaccinations. So he, you know, got anthrax vaccination was one of them. This was after 9-11. And um, what happened is he had a massive inflammatory response, and he died of um, massive hemorrhage uh, mm. within within two hours of getting the shot. And so, you know... He was engaged and, you know, he was all excited, 10 a.m. And then 12 p.m., like, his dad gets a call. He's gone, you know? And it's, it's just, it just happens. And it yeah. just happens. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't get the anthrax vaccine if you're joining the military. What I'm saying is there's always trade-offs. And this is not an ideological point. And so, like, everything is very polarized right now. And I'm just, like, setting the stage here. Um, you have a piece about Pfizer uh, financing, uh, you know, lob financing lobbying groups for COVID vaccine mandates. Now, you know, a lot of listeners, hopefully, I mean, they know about like public choice theory. Uh, you know, like these sorts of regulations, uh, regulatory agencies, they tend to get captured. And um, again, I'm vaccinated. Um, I think it does great things for like, you know, again, like. I'm not saying a 15 year old should be vaccinated. I, you know, like this is again, there's some leeway for choice. Everything is not as cut and dried as people say, but, but in general, okay. Like the science, I get the science. I'm not worried about the RNA it degrades, whatever. I'm a geneticist. It's not a big issue, but it's also not shocking to me that these big farm companies, pharma companies are lobbying and pushing it so that they can make an extra buck. Why is this surprising? So I, I, you know, when I read it, I was like, Oh yeah. But I was literally like, okay, yeah. Um, but now it's kind of an ideological thing where I'm sure people – so the, the previous um, expose or whatever that you did, uh, I'm sure like a lot of my conservative listeners, uh, the conservatives are like, yeah, you know, they're crooks, you know? Um, and now you're talking about like these vaccines and and like pharma companies and I don't know, like 10 years ago, it would probably be like people that would later become Bernie bros would be like, of course, pharma companies are crooked, you know? Yeah. But now it's more right wing people as well. I mean, it's I guess what I'm trying to say is like it this does fall out ideologically, but that it 
that's just where we are right now. And it's not anything necessary to the right or the left. Right. And I feel like um, there is a certain group of people and you're one of them who are looking at this issue less ideologically. Um, and it's just a, it's a little weird now because I think um, the standard left view is that vaccines and pharmaceutical companies are like awesome. <laughs> Which like okay like does that make sense like I mean it sounds a little yeah. weird saying that because no, five years definitely... ago but I mean I'm I'm right right like I'm not like crazy here totally right I I think my reporting hasn't changed at all I'm looking for interesting stories that affect the public interest and the pandemic has been wildly shaped by the power of just a few pharmaceutical companies what I'm doing hasn't changed you know in the very beginning of the pandemic I wrote about the lack of certain medical supplies, some of our trade policies, you know, why we're shipping, you know, masks overseas in the beginning of, of the pandemic when we needed to produce more, looking at some of the Trump trade policies. Then as the vaccine was being rolled out, I looked, I did like almost a dozen stories looking at the lobbying efforts by Big Pharma, Pfizer and others to crush efforts to share intellectual property and allow the creation of generic uh, COVID vaccines, um, you know, to there, there was this demand to speed up the creation of generic vaccines and get them to developing countries. Um, and now, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this COVID vaccine mandate. I've done a couple of stories kind of peeling back the weirder side of it that, you know, Pfizer was funding, not just lobbying groups, they were funding medical societies, civil rights organizations, even corporate watchdogs which endorsed the mandate, didn't disclose their Pfizer money. You know, there, there was a lot of funky money going on in 2021 when there was this big public battle over, you know, there's a lot of mandates, right? Like there were municipal, state, but then the big Biden mandate for, came out of OSHA saying that, you know, if you're an employer with 100 or more employees, you got to have COVID vaccine mandate. Otherwise, you know, weekly testing or, you know, you got to fire your workers. I mean, pretty extreme policy, especially when it perhaps was not really backed up by the scientific evidence. Um, you know, there was no exemption for uh, prior infection, natural immunity. Um, you know, there, there were claims from the CDC and Biden that if you took the vaccine, you would not get COVID. You know, you, there's no, it would end transmission. I mean, there, there wasn't evidence to make those claims. Now we really know that the, those claims were bunk. Um, in any case, you know, the, the stream of my reporting over the last three years, and I'm just looking at power and, and public policy and how interest groups shape that and, and how it affects, you know, how we responded to the the pandemic. And, you know, it, it, I think you're hundred percent right. This has become so polarized, so politicized. People are in camps and like they're, they're kind of squinting their eyes and looking at every stories and trying to see how they can code them. But it's like what I'm doing is completely consistent. You know, what, I'm pointing out the the issues with the, with the policy and how uh, a big uh, corporate power center mobilized public opinion, shifted public policy in a way that benefited them. You know, the, for Pfizer, the, their BioNTech vaccine is perhaps one, the most lucrative pharmaceutical product of all time. You know, how did this happen? How did they, they prevent a generic vaccine? How did they they mobilize public opinion to endorse this mandate that was very controversial. I mean, I'm, I'm just peeling back the layers here and it's, it's neither left or right, really. I think it's just, th this happened and, and why did it happen? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I want to get back to corporate power and, um, you know, the concentrations of power. Cause I think that this is kind of the through line of your reporting. Um, actually, you know, I mean, I did a little bit of research on you, like not the type of the research you would do. And it's just like, that's kind of a through line of what you've been doing. I mean, you know, I, I think like, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you would be a pretty comprehensible individual in terms of like, okay, left wing, anti-establishment, anti-corporate, you know, muck raking, blah, blah, blah. Like this is a type. That's what you were. And now it's a little weird because, um, you know, on the left or whatever you want to call it, the CIA is great and corporations are great, kind of, I think. I, I don't know. It's like it's it's hard sometimes to like follow it all. But I, I wanna talk about a couple of things where you did a little muckraking or digging on um 
individuals or specific issues that are a little different and like loop back to actually the the corporate and the ideological reconfigurations that might be happening at the end so um <laughs> okay uh <laughs> Mehdi Hassan all right so I mean this is like I don't like the guy. Um, I kind of respect his game uh, in terms of like he's monetized being a really shady, unfair operator. So I can kind of like, you know, you know, uh, don't hate the player. Uh, there is a part of that. I've seen his evolution and how he's uh, changed and evolved over time based on what's uh, effective for him. So for, for um, people who don't know. I think Mehdi Hassan's on MSNBC now, but, you know, he's also done stuff for Al Jazeera. I think he was at The Intercept, and apparently you guys had a big issue <laughs> where, <laughs> okay, I don't know what's happening in the offices of The Intercept, but he claimed that you were Islamophobic, and I don't really <laughs> know you that well, but I was just like, okay, like, this is some weird lie. And, like, how is Lee going to, you know, uh, so uh, this is kind of, like, gossipy, but, you know, like, this is, it's interesting because he's a big dude now. And um, sometimes I have noticed that people become powerful or um, uh, they're untouchable somehow. And I don't know. I'm not in media. I don't know how this works. So, for example, like, Hannah Nicole, or is it Nicole Hannah? Is it Nicole, Nicole Hannah? Hannah? Yeah. Okay, whatever. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, like, you know, she's, like, um giving lectures proudly presented by shell okay so the issue here is like look i'm not anti-oil or fossil fuel i'm not like an activist about that but you know these companies that when when you dance with the devil you do devilish things like you know i had friends who were geologists and they're like i'm not going to work for shell because uh literally like they've been involved in things where people have been executed uh, because they were inconvenient uh, for like Gabon or something, you know? Right. Uh, so I don't want to like underestimate. So it's just like a little weird to me that, you know, Jones is not, you know, and like some people I did point it out, like the international socialist obscure people, you know what I'm saying? Like there's going to be all some sort of le- left we- website that points it out. But, you know, there are people that become powerful enough where they have some sort of like plot armor and that you don't like point things out about them. And then there's other people, it's like, oh, um, that you said this like 18 years ago uh, in a bulletin board uh, channel. And it's like, so you're, you can't be accepted. Well, like Mehdi Hassan, you know, famously when he was a younger man, he said non-Muslims were dogs, you know? I mean, it's just like, he's recorded saying that. So it's not a big deal, I guess. Or like, you know, he's worked for Al Jazeera, which is, you know, candidly. And like, there's also other people who work for Al Jazeera who are super woke, but it's like a neo-feudal, you know, I mean, like, I've been to Cotter. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I mean, you think America has, like, a race issue? Like, Cotter is, like, next level, right? We don't need to get into it. But, you know, there's kind of, like, a plot. There's kind of, like, okay, like, you don't, like, talk about that because they cut checks for progressive journalists so whatever, right? So there are these things that are happening where it's like, I'm like, ah, uh, there's got to be something underneath this that I don't get because in other circumstances, you know, Oh, like someone gets like a, a grant from the Koch Foundation. Well, now you're like bad. And I'm like, Cotter's an absolute, like, I mean, yes, it's not totalitarian. I wouldn't say it's totalitarian, but like, I mean, I'll tell I'll tell you guys, like, you know, I went consulting in Cotter, and like the rule there is like, you never piss off the royal family. You piss off the royal family, you could get stuck in jail somewhere and nobody knows where you are. Like, that's literally what they told me. You know, this is the kind of government, this is the kind of society it is. So you just gotta like keep a low profile not piss them off and you're fine they'll give you money but if they come after you you best run you best get out of the country like have your passport ready you know don't let them take your passport these are the kind of things that i was told so you know Mehdi hassan like you started digging like he got so he got into it with i mean this is my perception you can correct me he got yeah. into it with some of your friends you know what i'm saying uh with people you know and then like you brought out your big guns and kind of you kind of roasted him, right? I mean, look, to be frank, Matt Taibbi is a friend. And, uh, but I've also, like, this is something, you know, he started lying. Mehdi Hassan went on his TV program and on Twitter was lying about reporting that I've done for eight months now. You know, a subject that I've, I've done a lot of reporting on. You know, pre-Twitter files, before Elon Musk, you know, was, was doing all this. 
Um, I was reporting based on leaked documents from a whistleblower, from litigation, from other, you know, disclosures, uh, some, some reporting on efforts by the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI to partner with the big social media platforms to police content, to police political speech on the internet. And then I did more reporting with the Twitter files and I've done other kind of um, digging around the subject. So, you know, it's something that I'm well acquainted with. I'm, you know, I, I know what, what, I'm, what I'm talking about here. And Mehdi, I don't think he actually read any of the reporting or the documents. He goes on Twitter and on the MSNBC and just lies and, and claims that, you know, the Department of Homeland Security was not involved in some of these social media moderation efforts and, and claimed that Matt Taibbi making these claims was, was, was lying. And so it's like, all right, I'll, I'll just fact check you. I'll provide more emails. I've got a number of uh, Twitter files, emails that confirm what Matt Taibbi had said. And I just gave more context and, and an explanation. I did a regular kind of story saying, hey, Matty, look, you're, you're, you're getting it wrong here on the facts of, of this partnership between the government and social media. And then he just goes on a two day nonstop tweet rant, you know, calling me a liar, just ad hominem stuff, calling me an Islamophobe, <laughs> you know, uh, rather than engage with any of the documents or reporting that I've engaged in. Um, it's this kind of scurrilous, you know, you're a racist, you're a bigot because you disagree with me. And you know, that's worked really well for, for Mehdi. Uh, he, if you look at what he did in the UK when he was a journalist there, Every day was accusing people of being sexist or, you know, whatever, racist, xenophobic, whatever. And he's come here and we're, I think there's actually bigger professional incentives to engage in that type of, I don't even know if it's journalism. It's, it's something. It's like, it's, it's like a left wing version of being Rush Limbaugh, but I, I think a little bit more grating. You know, you're, you know, you're, you're a commentator that, that mocks and vilifies and tries to deperson people with this vicious accusation of saying anyone you disagree with anyone on, on a, the other side of a political debate is, is a bigot that needs to be expelled from civil to some uh, you know polite society that that's what Mehdi does i mean i mean look on lexus nexus you know, or any kind of news archive do a transcript search of Mehdi and the word racist it's like every night like that's, that's what he does he doesn't do any new reporting doesn't provide any new context and so he tried to apply that to me he said i'm a, I'm a racist i mean uh, against muslims um Absolutely absurd. I've, you know, I've uh, never engaged in, in that. Uh, he's referring to a tweet that I made years ago, telling him that when he was beating up on Tulsi Gabbard when she was in Congress, saying that she was basically a stooge of uh, of Narendra Modi in India. I'm like, look, there are many members of Congress who are friendly to Modi. She's really not the only one, but you're going to beat up on the one Hindu lawmaker. You know, it, it, it seems unfair to say that she's like a, some kind of foreign agent of Narendra Modi. Like, would you like that? Wouldn't it be fair for people to say that you're a foreign stooge of, uh, you know, of Qatar because you, you're taking a check. You know, he was working for Al Jazeera and, and Intercept at the same time. And like, you wouldn't like that either. You know, I, I wasn't I, that, that's that's the extent of my comment. He said that um, that shows my Islamophobia or something. I mean, it's just, it's just absolute an a, absolutely ridiculous accusation. But. You know, that kind of led to one thing or another. It's like, all right, I'm not going to let Mehdi unperson me and, and, and vilify me and engage in this kind of gutter tactic. Um, I just did a little story looking at, at his career over the last 25 years that, you know, he does this over and over again. He kind of angles for whatever, you know, career path that he's, he's going towards. And he has a, a, a kind of long history of taking other people's arguments, sometimes even literally plagiarizing just to get ahead. I mean, if you really want to understand Mehdi, um, he applied to the Daily Mail, which is the you know the, the equivalent of Fox News in the UK, and you've got to read this this the, the letter. He says, "Look, I'm on the left, but I can be basically your friendly labor Muslim commentator who can attack the left by being with the left, and you know I, I believe in, in in strong social conservatism, and I can help advance you know your editorial line." They rejected him. And then, of course, he goes on TV and basically compares them to a Nazi outlet. It's like you wanted to work for this for an for outlet that you basically said was was neo that you basically say is neo fascist when they didn't accept you and they didn't give you this, you know, plum gig that you're angling for. Then you accuse them of being a racist. I mean, this this is 
this is kind of part and parcel to who he is. And, I, you know, I, I, everyone, I think, who who's followed Mehdi on Twitter or, you know, followed these debates has seen that, that infamous kind of speech he gave when he was in his late 20s or early 30s, um, uh, you know, comparing gays and uh, atheists uh, to, you know, to dogs, like the cattle, like you were mentioning. Um, you know, for me, I don't think he's actually changed a lot. He's just swapped out his enemies. He was, he, when he was a socially conservative Muslim, he vilified, you know, their, their chosen enemy. Now that he's a MSNBC Democrat, he has a new set of enemies that he wants to vilify. You know, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's for a personality that, that's kind of focused on attacking and destroying people with very bad faith arguments. He's just picked uh, a different audience. And so he's picked a, a different group of characters. He hasn't actually changed. He's not, he's not become more nuanced or thoughtful. Yeah, uh, that, that, that sounds right. I, again, like I said, like, I had no idea that you had any opinions on Islam. So I remember <laughs> seeing that and I just started laughing because I was like, okay, there's a backstory here and I'm just going to like follow Cause like I would, uh, I checked up on what you were saying in terms of your responses because I knew that it was kind of going to be juicy because uh, he was obviously BSing, just like kind of – he was throwing stuff against the wall and seeing what it, what would stick. Now, a lot of people on the left in particular, if you use that sort of insult, you go into a defensive crouch and then, you know, once you start doing that, you're, you're lost. And you didn't do that. So, I mean, I think whatever, you're fine. Um, so I want to like um, close out as, in our conversation – um, obviously, uh, like, you know, just listeners know I subscribe to your sub stack, um, you know, uh, finally just like, I want to support you, but also like, you know, you're producing content pretty regularly. I do think that, you know, as someone who doesn't produce content that regularly, but does it like longer form, um, I, I will say like, there is an angle where people will wait, but you know, I think in the beginning, it makes sense what you're doing. Um, that's the advice that I'm going to give you. But um, aside from that, um, and I know you're doing already, you're already doing pretty well. So whatever, it's not like you need the advice. Um, I was just like double checking. I kind of knew some of this stuff. So you were at um, Think Progress with uh, Zaid Jelani and a bunch of other people that came out of that. And um, I'm, I'm mentioning Zaid because you guys kind of had this weird trajectory where, okay, so you were at Think Progress, which is basically a Democrat, uh, Democratic think tank uh, that was, you know, it was kind of like Obama, you know. Uh, brain trust or post Obama people that left the administration or were going to go the administration um, and stuff like that. Uh, you were, you were like a president of the Federation of Mary Maryland college Democrats. Um, you interned for Stephanie Tubbs and Steny Hoyer. Uh, you were uh, at um, media matters for America. And, okay. Like some of this stuff I didn't know. I was like, should I be talking to this guy? <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm not gonna lie. So I mean, like, um, you're laughing because uh, I don't like I said my my impression of you is uh, you kind of have stayed the same, uh, but the world around you has kind of shifted. Um, so you did this Twitter files thing that basically me. I mean, Twitter is apparently according to the Atlantic a far right social network. So you're carrying water for a far right social network now. Uh, Elon Musk is. I mean, I don't want to get into what he is, but, you know, like now you're an ancillary to him. Uh, you defended Matt Taibbi, a conservative journalist. Um, Glenn Greenwald, a far right wing <laughs> person, is a friend of yours from what I can. I'm just saying, like, what is happening here um, with you, you guys, you know, because like I know a lot of you and, um, you know, you had like a little dust up during BLM. We don't necessarily need to talk about that, but. There, there's just stuff that's been happening over the last like three or four years. And, um, you know, I'm like, I'm on the right quote unquote, whatever, if I have some politics. So I just been kind of an observer, but it's been really weird because there's a bunch of you, a handful and, you know, you're always like interacting with each other and you guys were like writing for mother Jones or nation, you know, Taibi had that Rolling Stone piece about Goldman Sachs. Like after the, you know, after 2008, like during the Obama era, you guys were not really Obama Democrats. You were further left. You were like proto Bernie people, you know? And now, like, I don't know what you are. Um, I, I know that you're not, I mean, you're not like, I don't know. You have like some people have like done the full transition and become like Trump people. I don't think you have. I don't think no. any of you have. On the other hand, um, 
I don't know what you guys are. Maybe that's good. Maybe that's bad. I mean, what do you think about all that? Because, like, look, you're you're you. You've been through this. I'm sure sometimes, like, you get up in the morning. I don't know, and you're just like, wait, wait. Like these people are like way more conservative than me. Like, what's going on? Like, why am I the reactionary or whatever they call you? You know? Yeah, I mean, I'm just I'm. I don't have all the answers. I'm trying to just do good journalism and I do have a certain set of values, but I don't want to be too prescriptive about things. I, I, I care about the public interest. I want people to live happy, healthy, prosperous lives. I want to live in an open democracy with lots of civil debate. And, um, you know, I, I care about this country. You know, I, I've, I've taken maybe a, a non-traditional path. You know, I, I grew up in the DC area and, you know, I was really into punk music and hardcore music and I went to a lot of concerts and there's like a political angle to this kind of music scene. So I ended up going to a lot of protests, protesting their war in Iraq, you know, went up to New York for that, went to all these protests for issues I didn't really understand as, as a young teenager. Um, and, you know, there, there, there was an element where it kind of aligned with my values, but also made me feel uncomfortable because I was like, I remember thinking at the time, I, you know, if you're talking about Bush as some kind of theocratic fascist and the Iraq war as part of this, you know, imperial project to colonize the, the Middle East, how is marching around chanting a slogan dressed, you know, in a funny way going to affect any of this change? You know, I, I felt a lot of cognitive dissonance as a teenager and I got really into the online blog world. I wrote, a, I, I read David Brock's book, <laughs> you know, um, I remember in high school and I, I read him a letter and I think I was the very first intern at Media Matters back in 2005 because they, they took me. They were like, oh, okay, you want to be an intern here? And, um, or maybe I was the second. I, I don't know. I, I was like among the first interns at, at Media Matters. And I, I, you know, I was following this whole new, you know, By I read Byron York's book, you know, conservative guy, but he wrote about this new democratic infrastructure that was taking shape as a, as a reaction to kind of Bush and the, the success of the conservative movement. I, I learned about groups like CAP and some of the, you know, donors and strategists involved. I wrote to them as a, as a teenager and I tried to get more involved in politics um, just by the nature of growing up in the D.C. area. I, I started just interning everywhere that would take me. I interned, you know, uh, in high school, you know, going into college every semester in college, every summer. I just tried everything because I, I wanted I desperately wanted to influence politics to make society better somehow to have my voice heard but i also always felt this kind of conflict with the nature of working in any political job that you're kind of a peon and you're told what to do and you have no real voice and most of these political institutions on the center left are also kind of corrupt and evil in their own way you know um i, I felt you know i was seen as the crazy left winger at cap you know kind of pushing um the envelope on what we could report uh, lots of conflicts there uh, fighting with with our, our you know, their cap received a lot of corporate money, uh, had a lot of alliances with the administration and with Democrats, and you know we're we're, we're constantly getting in 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 conflict. Um, it, I I really enjoyed my time working there, but you know it it, it wasn't kind of a perfect situation for me personally. Um, and you know I, I drifted out of that, started my own invest investigative website. Uh, and, and co-founded with, with some other folks. Uh, we pissed off all our donors. That collapsed. I kind of floated through working for different magazines and, and outlets, eventually landing at, at The Intercept in 2015. And while, you know, the, the early days of The Intercept provided a lot of intellectual freedom, a lot of journalistic freedom, it kind of devolved into just another nation or Mother Jones where, you know, there's this kind of uh, monolithic, culture on the supposed far left that is intolerant of any kind of di political disagreement. Um, they kind of, There's a mass stereotyping of people of color as all, you know, um, uh, oppressed victims or, or whatever. I mean, th there's, these narratives on the left kind of have a, have a life of their own that's just not journalistic. You know, your, your job as a journalist is to go out there and ask tough questions. It doesn't matter if you're if you're, you know, Joe Biden or AOC, you, sh you should be able to be critical of any uh, politician. And, you know, there, there was a lot of water carrying for various activist groups or, um, you know, uh, groups on the left with a certain type of sloganeering. 
I wasn't comfortable with that. And that led to some public, um, some public issues. So, you know, I don't think I've fundamentally changed. I've matured and gained new skills and all these experiences, you know, uh, contribute to who I am today. Um, but uh, seen as the heterodox person at the intercept or the far left person um, at Think Progress, you know, I don't know. It, it's all, it's all about context. You know, I, I was in Denmark earlier this year and, you know, their, their center left party, which has dominated uh, recent elections, they've done very well. They, they have universal health care, you know, ed- higher education is free. They've got a great infrastructure. They're, they're very anti-immigrant. You know, that's, that's like to, to espouse what the center left does in Denmark. You would be called a Nazi here in the U.S., even though they provided a lot of the economic kind of utopia that, that leftists dream of here. I mean, if you go to grad school in Denmark, not only is it free, they pay you. They pay you to go to grad school there. And it's high quality education. Um, it's, it's just it's, it's all about the context you're in. Right. Like, I don't think what I'm, what I'm doing is fundamentally that extreme or or, or whatever. But but our, our current political context keeps changing. Now, if free speech is seen as a right wing uh, value, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I, don't, I, just, I, just, I disagree with that. You know, it's a, it's a code word. Yeah, it's a you know, code it's word. A do- um, dog whistle. No, that's right. And you know, I just I want to be honest to who I am, and I don't have all the answers, but I, I want to represent my values and my journalism. Yeah, I mean, um, you know. One thing that I that I and like maybe you can speak on it because you are a journalist. Um, you know, something's happened over the last like three or four years on certain cultural topics. People have just shut down, and so there's all these group chats and you know private conversations and people. I don't, I you know, and I don't. Sometimes people evolve. Um, you know, so. Well, okay, I'll give you an example. I'll give a concrete example because it's it's in the public record. Although, um. I knew this. Uh, I'm not going to say how I knew it. I don't want to be, I, I don't like to like personal correspondence, personal correspondence. But so for example, like Ryan Cooper, who's a big guy on the left um, is messaging Jesse single in 2018, how he's, you know, thinks that some of this trans stuff is a little too far and he's not going to change his views. Now he's changed his views. Is he sincere or not? I don't know. I mean, you can't know the hearts of men, uh, but this is a common issue uh, you see this on, you know, you see this um, in other ways. You know, people go from being Bernie bros uh, to alt right, dissident right, like far right activists within a year. I don't really get that. I mean, I just I don't get that. You know what I'm saying? Like I've always like like you. I think like, partly because I'm not like super political. I've never been an activist, nor have I ever wanted to get involved in DC stuff. It's just like I got some views. Uh, like you know, for example, like you know, I mean, I'm quote, pro-choice. I support abortion rights. I'm not going to change that view just because I guess like I'm in a coalition with people that want to ban it. Uh, That's just, I have friends who are, you know, I have friends that are involved in pro-life activism. So whatever, but it is what I, it it is what it is, but it seems like everyone has to be on the same page in a lot of these movements. And like, okay, that makes sense when you're in a political movement or you're a center for American progress or heritage, but how is this happening in journalism? So, for example, what happened to you, and people can Google it, we don't need to relitigate it, um, during BLM. Okay, during BLM, there was like a lot of fear uh, within journalism about saying anything, and people were just like kind of venting privately, from what I can tell. I mean, I saw some of it myself, but I'm not in the hardcore journalism group chats and stuff like that. Um, is that like abated, or is this like just the new normal, and anyone who basically doesn't – so? The whole reading the room thing, for example, like I think it's just BS. I think it's just a dispositional thing. Some people are terrified about being like the odd person out, and so they always are reading the room. But that like leads to basically irrational herds, in my opinion. Um, I don't think you know. And so, but is that is that just the way journalism is now? I mean, I don't know. You know, I think it's always been the case that way. You know, if you read books, uh, what's that? The boys on the bus and the the, the book on the was it the 68 or 72 presidential election that, you know, there'd be the top reporters that would kind of pick the narrative of the day of, you know, in the way to frame the, the major presidential candidates. And then all the kind of lower level, mid-level reporters would basically copy them. You know, so there's this, there's always been this kind of herd mentality in, in journalism. It's just social media has become our like panopticon where we're all kind of afraid, or at least I should say that most journalists are afraid 
of stepping outside the lines of, of what's become the acceptable conventional thinking. And, you know, if you read the room and after 9-11, you would agree, you'd have to agree with all the kind of war on terror, Iraq war stuff. Uh, if you read the room on COVID policy, you'd have to agree that the lab leak theory was racist, you know, like it's conventional elite opinion is often wrong, you know, and, and I, I think that's, that's what's dangerous. It, it, it shields, uh, it, it blocks critical inquiry. It blocks journalists from doing their basic job. It's a big part of why Americans don't trust the media because they see these gigantic lies, especially on identity and, and, and criminal justice, where it's like, you know, these are these are messy issues. They require nuance and, and, and treating people as individuals, not as parts of stereotype groups. Um, we just, um, but we just don't see that on, on the left. You know, the 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 death of traditional uh, newspapers clustered people, like you mentioned in the very beginning of this, into digital outlets. Digital outlets have imploded. You know, Buzz, BuzzFeed is now written by bots, <laughs> which is kind of amazing. Uh, and... Uh, kind of left as these, you know, floating around on, on social media, mimicking each other in, in fear of getting canceled. And it's it's not a great climate for interesting journalism. Like you just re like read most of the center left publications on democratic politics. They all say the exact same thing. It's just, it, 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 it's not even very insightful because they're constantly getting it wrong too. Um, I, I don't really understand yeah. it, but it, it, it kind of, I think cues to just personality types. There are certain personality types that really want to be part of a social group and they don't want to feel rejection. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I disagree a lot with my friend Zed Jelani, who you also mentioned. Uh, but I, what I enjoy about him is that we can get into it about politics. Uh, we can disagree strongly and we're always kind of, we have a kind of transgressive, bone in our bodies that we're always asking questions about politics and about the media and a lot of other journalists i meet don't you know i just i don't get it but that's that's just again like that's part of their character yeah let me just close out um you know we've been talking for a while um you know and this is kind of like i try to keep this podcast evergreen like not talk too much about uh contemporary stuff but i'm just gonna because i think it's gonna be a big deal for a while the whole New York subway, Jordan Neely, uh, you know, uh, and um, Damian Penny, whatever. And, you know, I, I don't talk too much about stuff like this because, like, what the fuck do I know? You know, I'm just, you know, but, like, I'm seeing people, the commentary, and, you know, this is right and left. Like, I knew that every single right wing person will be like, you know, he was justified, crazy guy, blah, blah, blah. And deify and that, him, you know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then, like, the left wing is, like, well, of course, like, there's crazy people that are going to scream in your three-year-old toddler's face on the subway. What do you expect? I'm like, okay, you know? It, it was just, like, this is, like, within, like, hours. So I don't say anything partly because, like, look, there's other stuff going on. You know, I got my own life. I got my own business. I got my own family. Um, don't these people, too? But anyway, I, I understand being a pundit online is a thing. And, like, you know, I should be one to speak. But, you know, I have opinions on things I know about. I don't know anything – I don't know beyond what the person on the street knows about these sorts of things, um, but it's just interesting how – and then there's also, like, the flip where it's like, oh, well, you know, people who are scared of certain words think that you should just kind of accept extremely aggressive, loud, kind of mentally unstable people running around, your children. You know, I just like the the whole thing is like okay, like you had this pre written. Like I'm not. I, it's like you only read these commentary for entertainment purposes only. Like you know that there's no sincere working it out independently of the hive mind, right? Well, you you know that's I I, I wish I just want to take an optimistic view. I think there's. I mean, for I, I this is really the I don't want to use this term, but for, for lack of a better term, a silent majority that does not want to go into this kind of tribalistic camp mode of, you know, turning everything into a partisan slugfest. I think there's a lot of people that are just like, all right, look, we don't know all the answers. We really don't like the extreme kind of views around this. You know, initially there were a lot of elite 
media, a lot of clickbaity media, a lot of uh, left-wing politicians like Tiffany Caban and others who are so quick to racialize this and say, this was a you know white man who lynched a black man. Um, and then, you know, now, now we see kind of the far right seizing this with, with, with some kind of racialized terms. It's like, just like, let's, let's cool down. And if you present the facts and what's known and you kind of call out the extremes, I think there's, a, there's actually a big audience for that as well. It's just that social media and much of the mainstream media hypes, um, you know, really bad behavior in terms of the, 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 the folks seeking to politicize this. But a lot of folks are, are working through these issues, wondering about it, and they're they're tired of the loudest voices in the room. I, I'm I'm kind of you know I, I I don't live in New York, but living in San Francisco, it's almost the ident- identical issue. You know, like we have, you know, of it's actually in some ways worse because we spend a lot more per capita, you know, per per homeless person per per, per addict on the street, and we're getting maybe even worse results. Um, so this is something that, that just interests me, interests me for a very long time because I've watched the the far left in my city, uh, the ACLU and others, fight involuntary commitment, you know, greater intervention by the state for severely addicted, severely mentally ill people who are in danger to themselves and others, you know, fight any kind of institutional, any type of plan to institutionalize these people and get them the treatment they need. You know, Jordan Neely desperately needed involuntary treatment if he if he had police had questioned him one month before this incident in the subway back in april they didn't even notice that he had an active warrant for his arrest social workers had flagged him as as a serious risk you know that's a i mean big picture that's a failing of the state why didn't the state do more if they had taken him off the streets into treatment that he needed we wouldn't have had this incident i mean that that's this kind of, like you know i i hear from the far left you know, we can't look at in isolated incidents. We need to look at systemic root causes, root causes. It's like, okay, there was a root cause here. Why aren't you talking about it? You're actually doing the very opposite of what you claim to believe in, in terms of how we should cover public policy and politics. And I, I, I wish that was the discussion, but I think there actually isn't a big audience for it. Well, I'm going to hope so because um, uh, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I like your work. I like what you're doing. Um, I hope you, uh, you know, get more subscribers. People should uh, check uh, leafung.com. Uh, that's where you can, the URL, but just type your name. Um, there's a lot of good stuff. I mean, we didn't talk about everything. You've been producing a lot of content recently. Like I said, like, you know, uh, <laughs> it's just like, okay, I tell Freddie, Freddie DeBoer about, it's like, dude, just chill out on the fire hose. Like, you don't need to do this, you know? Like, we want you to, like, not burn out. So uh, just, like, that's the only advice that I, uh, I'll give you on that. Um, I think, uh, you know, what you're saying is very well taken. Um, there is an audience out there. I think, I mean, look, I mean, people can look at how many paid subscribers you already have. There already is an audience out there, right? Um, so uh, keep doing that. And, um, you, know, I, you know, I have like listeners across the ideological spectrum. And um, what I would say is it's important uh, to kind of highlight and support and cherish the people who actually uh, still do believe in truth. Like we're all human beings. We all have our viewpoints. We all have our biases. Uh, but there's there's still a middle ground where you're actually striving for this idea of objective truth out there. Uh, whether you're right or wrong on any specific cases, Lee, I, I do think that you are striving for that. And that's the first place that we have to start. Um, you know, politics is today a team sport. And, um, you know, that's just like, not sustainable, I think, in a democracy uh, for this to go to the max where all institutions are culturally polarized. Uh, you know, the last thing I'll say is, like, um, we'll see, but um, it doesn't look like um, AI doomerism has been culture ward yet. Um, but if it does, I swear to God, um, you know, it could be that we will see Mehdi Hassan next year write about um, that he, for one, welcomes his AI overlords. <laughs> And I'm only half joking. I mean, I don't know. It could be many or it could be someone, um, you know, uh, at Newsmax also do it. I, you don't know because it's sometimes this stuff is kind of arbitrary. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, you get caught on the wrong side. You're like, wait a second. I'm right wing now. I'm left wing now. Like, you don't even know. You know, like, it's like whiplash. Oh, it's going to change. And then we're going to a presidential election. So it's going to be silly season. A lot of all of the all the, this dynamic is only going to get worse. Uh you know, Mehdi will constantly goes 
after Matt Taibbi saying that because of the Twitter follows, he's now captured by Elon Musk and will criticize Twitter. It's like, no, it's not true. He has criticized Twitter. Many a son does not criticize his own parent company donating to lots of Trump Republicans or engaging in union busting right now during the writer's strike or, you know, engaging in all kinds of corporate influence peddling that he claims to oppose. You know, we, we a lot of this can be turned around, but I don't know. I'm just trying to do what, what I'm really enjoying the move to Substack. It's invigorating me. You're right. I don't want to get burned out. But um, right now, I'm not close to being burned out at all. I'm just kind of getting over a little uh infection but i i'm excited to publish a lot more i have a lot more coming and i appreciate this time receive i'm a big fan of your sub stack i've forwarded a lot of your pieces along to friends and family i've learned about extremely esoteric uh genocides committed by the chinese <laughs> people against various mongolian tribes i had no idea about this history and now i feel way more you know nourished with wait, this knowledge well so now now your, your chinese guilt is kicking wait aren't you like you're um wait you're mixed race right you're eurasian right yeah, my father's from China. Yeah, yeah. So you have Chinese guilt and white guilt, bro. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a great blend. <laughs> they kind of right. cancel each other out. Uh, well, you're canceled, so definitely. <laughs> All right, it was great talking to you, man. I'll see you online. Yeah, good to talk to you. Take care. This podcast for kids. Yes. <laughs>